Welcome to the C Word That Can Serve This podcast. Today we're talking about historic houses. I'm Jenna Mathiason, an objects conservator based in Carmarthen in Wales. And I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservator based in Manchester in England. I'm Liz Aber, a paintings conservator in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Hey guys. Oh, hi everyone. So you know me guys, you I do like starting with a definition. What the heck is a historic house? Mm-hmm. And are they sometimes called historic house museums? Mm, see, I'm excited about this because um we're not yet used to being as global as we are now and <laughs> um I feel like this is a different definition to just UK. That's interesting. Yeah. UK has quite a lot of historic properties. Oh, so many. Yeah. So many. And I was sort of curious about like historic house. To me, that has a domestic implication. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think that's where it's at for me. It's like I expect a historic house to be somewhere people live. Yeah. Like I don't think of a castle as a historic house, even though technically oh. people lived in it, because I think a castle and a castle ruin or a castle that's like properly, yeah, you know, yeah. like okay. the well guarded fortress type stuff. Right. I'm like, I'm kind of like, I'm over that. That's a castle. That's not a historic house. <laughs> But historic houses where someone like truly lived, sort of like this sort of more, I don't know, but this is me, right? Like this is clearly some some of my baggage that I'm taking to this definition, mm. right? Yeah. So one of the organizations in the UK that looks after all historic houses is uh, an organization called the National Trust. And they look after something like... They, okay, so I looked at their annual report for a snoop, uh, and it said 330 houses, 192 historic houses. What? 47 industrial sites, uh, 11 lighthouses, 41 castles, 56 villages, 37 medieval barns and 39 pubs. Now, this means that a pub is not a historic house. (laughs) A lighthouse is not a historic house. Um, A castle is not a historic house by that definition. Mm. I'm sort of interested in how like this nitty gritty breaks down. But Mm. it made me think a lot about the domesticity potentially Mm. of a historic house, Mm -hmm. depending on where you go with it. But I'm not married to it, but I sort of feel like I do treat castles as a different class of thing. I see castles as standing archaeology or 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 like yeah, no, I you know, sort of standing structure type things. So it's more of a landmark or more uh, of a landmark. Yeah, yeah, more okay. like more of an archaeological site, more of a landmark. Whereas a historic house is something that has been passed down directly from the aristocrats that lived there um and sold to the national trust for the use by the aristocrats no it doesn't but you know that's that is there's a reason why we have so many in this country so many like you know mansions and 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 um big historic homes in this country i would say that that's the majority of the historic houses that you're familiar with what that they're aristocratic places yes yeah like the gentry lived there and stuff and they you know they directly in the UK, I would say so, yes. Mm. Owned to the people that lived in the land and they, you know. Yeah, it is. it does have a whiff of, you know, this is nobleman's places. You oh, know, like 100%. It does have that. You know, yeah, yeah. it does tend to be that. It's not always, it should be said. And I think it varies a tiny bit between different organisations that maybe look after them and stuff like that. Mm, but Historic okay. Houses does have a slight tendency to be more... This is, a, this is a manor house sort of mm-hmm. thing or mm-hmm. a mansion. Mm. But if you look at places like uh, the Historic Houses Association, maybe it's called, I don't know. Uh, Historic Houses, anyway, which is another one of these organisations in the UK that looks after historic houses, unsurprisingly. You know, they can be things like townhouses, a merchant lived here, um, or this was important for some other reason, uh, or this is where an artist lived or something like that. So there, it, it can be a little bit more varied. Yeah, historic houses that have an artist, they were the home of an artist, are some of my favorite. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm so not surprised. <laughs> oh my God, so much so, yeah. Completely. And especially when they have a little bit of the the home life element as well. It's not just a focus on, on the studio space, it's also yeah, yeah, what yeah. living mm-hmm. there have been like. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, really, really yeah. cool. I have to say, the Rembrandt house in Amsterdam so that's a very good oh my job God. of combining the two. Oh, excellent. That's really yeah. nice. See, 
an example that springs to mind for me in terms of a uh, historic house that's um, a museum and and is an artist or was an artist residence uh, is Kettle's Yard in Cambridge, which is fairly f- fairly famous in the UK, and it's like the the house is kept sort of largely as they wanted it. It is a living display in some ways. The lemon gets replaced in the bowl, uh, you know, like that sort of thing. That's the sort of stuff we're at here, right? Where it's like always needs to be a fresh lemon in the bowl um but it's it's kept in a certain way in the way mandated by well, the yeah, people who that's left a big it part of it keeping the the museum in a a bit of a time bubble which i think must yeah be so interesting from a conservation perspective because usually we have collections that are moving through a space or there's something changing and with a house museum it's all about keep preserving rather than actively changing not everything that's owned by the house or that was owned by the family will be in the house and like in the living room kind of thing because i'm sure that you know the people the owners the original owners had storerooms and stuff and if all of the rooms are open to the public then where's all the stuff all the personal items the not all the personal items but you know the the um the artwork and the mm-hmm. furniture and the you know the 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 other things the other sort of ephemera of the wealthy <laughs> um, that that was collected the owners of large historic houses are often or, or historically often have their own collections of stuff as well i'm actually thinking about the one in glasgow that i can't remember the name of right now but they have a, a vast collection of um i think spanish art I mean, it's got to be said for like the sort of maybe stereotypical National Trust property here mm. would be something like a manor house mm. in like a vast parkland type mm-hmm. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, the National Trust looks after both the natural environment around the properties and also the properties. So they're sort of very conscious about it being both in harmony mm-hmm. um, sort of thing. So they sort of do conservation, the one we say we always don't do nature um, and <laughs> also conservation of the type that we do do <laughs> the stuff um, so it is a confusing but beautiful mishmash of the two yes so it does conservation in its most holistic sense in that it does all kinds i didn't yeah. know that about the national trust i'm mm. curious now how universal that is among different national trusts mm. because i recently was looking into the national trust in italy and I was at a house museum in Milan. They had um, a separate area that was a video about the nature portion of their national trust. Oh, cool. And they made it quite a large focus at this specific property, which I wasn't expecting, especially since That's there were cool. gardens on the property. It it just added this. Uh otherness to it and i'm sure there are other mm. properties that are like far in the countryside with huge vineyards etc like they maintain all of this it's really quite impressive that's really cool yeah that does make me wonder how much of that like is applicable across europe yeah. for example or across the world like are, are they perhaps combined more often than we think uh because the the landscape and the the buildings in them often go together in a very specific way mm. um you know like not just if they have big fancy gardens, but even if it's just a case of the rolling hills outside of this and the trees you can see. Quite from a lot the- of the grounds and stuff were um, actually, well, in the you know early 1800s, were actually part of the whole structure, part of the whole building and part of the whole design in the, with the picturesque that came in. So that's where mm. you get the follies and things that spring yeah, up yeah. all over the place. And like deer parkland is, is yeah. you know, not functional uh, space. It's for swanning about in. <laughs> for swanning about in, I love it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I totally know what you mean, though. Yeah. So the, I, I guess that's the sort of stereotypical sort of national trust property when I think about yeah and perhaps unfairly but I do think of the sort of the manor house which is full of Mm. paintings Mm. fancy furniture and it has a giant massive garden or some green space outside that you get to enjoy Um, this brings to mind my personal favourite house museum I have a funny feeling I might bring it up a few times in this conversation yes please (laughs) you go for it (laughs) it is the Isabella Stewart Gardner in Boston 
Uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner was an aristocratic woman, big surprise, uh, in the <laughs> late 18, early 1900s. And uh, she, upon losing her child, didn't want to have any more kids, uh, wanted to stay an aristocratic lady, but she was kind of bored by the Boston set. So she traveled to Europe and she started collecting. She built her own property kind of on the outskirts of Boston. Now it's in the center, but it's used to be on the outside. <laughs> yeah, things have changed. <laughs> <Right>. Terrifying. <laughs> it's right across the street from the MFA. Like the MFA is where it is oh, wow, because yeah, okay. of this museum. So she built the building to her specifications and it is styled after like a Venetian palazzo. She spent a lot of time in Venice um, and she filled the entire house and curated it as a museum. And during her lifetime, oh, wow. it was open to the public and it was designed to her exact tastes. There are so many little details and the way that the rooms are organized is sort of by genre, but it's not stuffy. It's very playful and fun. And upon her death, she made it clear that nothing was to be moved. And ever since then, no additions have been made to the museum. Uh, nothing gets loaned out very often, sometimes, because there are a few really, really phenomenal mm-hmm. pieces in there. So they do have to loan them out. But oh, that's nice. everything is exactly the way that she kept it. It's, that is it's cool. really, really a special place. So um, I'm so glad you said that because I was, as we started talking about the along the lines of how did the National Trust get all these things? Why are they now in, why are they open to the public now? Why are they now historic sites rather than, you know, for two and a half people to live in (laughs) or whatever it was? (laughs) So I was convinced, and I just looked it up, um, I'm pretty sure it's true, that historic houses have a history of being open to the public, even when they were in their sort of absolute golden days of being Ooh. used um the only reason i know this is because of that bit in pride and prejudice yeah in the, I, I would like to say i'm talking about the book okay oh sure but we all know the scene <laughs> when lizzie and the gardeners the aunt and uncle go to the open house at pemberley right yes that's right yes. right and then they accidentally bump into colin firth in a wet shirt you know <laughs> What a wonderful moment. <laughs> wonderful moment. Um, so I think that and you saying that, it's all, clearly these these were open um, oh. and it's more than just the sort of antiquarian, if you're also wealthy, you can come and have a look at my stuff that I stole. Okay, so you're, you're saying that there's a tradition here of not quite showing off, but inviting people in. Yeah, kind of, I th- and I think showing off is fair because quite a lot of these people that like when you go to a historic house or at least in the uk um if you go to a historic house and speak to the the explainers there they will say and so and so did this to this quarter of the house and so and so did that to that quarter of the house and this is because this person was interested in this kind of architecture and this person didn't give a damn or whatever the like practice of having an open houses for historic homes does go back quite far um one of the earliest examples I can think of is from the Renaissance. In Florence, there was a huge uh, motivation to keep, like, have your wealth, but don't be too withholding and give something back to the public, a way to appease them with beauty and mm, art. Look, look, we have social value. Honest. <laughs> <laughs> why the Renaissance happened. Yeah. Could I hear from both of you a historic home that is near and dear to your heart? Oh, Ooh, that's such a good one. I like Gawthorpe Hall. Where is that? Um, it's in my neck of the woods, so sort of West Yorkshire-ish. Um, and it has a textile collection. And it's just, it's nice and dinky, you know? It's like, it's its not Chatsworth. Chatsworth is great, obviously, but its it's not sort of overwhelming. And there's more, there's a more sort of domestic side of things that's, you know... There's a good combination of the fancy rooms and then the domestic rooms, you know. I I like that. And I like my favourite bit is always the kitchen. <gasps> yes. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> kitchen people. This is where the food comes from. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. What's your favourite part about a kitchen? Um, 
I think it's the things surrounding the kitchen. So like, like the corridors that led to the different places where, where you know, oh, people nice. were served. Okay. And, you know, yeah. the, the places that were actually walked by people. Mm. I, can, I can see that. And, I, you know, the, the way that these places are connected to the outdoor areas as well because those outdoor areas are also more functional like there's the the obviously the kitchen garden things and where vegetables might have been grown and all that i just i just that tickles my imagination more than so and so would have had to go sideways in her dress because it was so large you know <laughs> yeah it's a bit more relatable <laughs> yeah exactly ways. yeah <laughs> this is where people are scurried across with hot cups of tea gotcha. exactly yeah yeah exactly I can get behind that <laughs> No, I totally it's see that. Of the daily life. Yeah, life of the exactly. Daily life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be a complete rebel and an outlier here and say that actually I don't know. I do like Kettle's Yard because I find Ooh. I find the tranquility in it immense if it's not too busy with other people. Yeah. <laughs> but like if you can find a quiet time, then it's a very nice, soothing place to be. And it's lovely from that point of view. It's mm. a place where I would probably spend forever if I could just make sure that no one else got in. Um <laughs> <laughs> but that's fine because um, it, it's it's sort of a place that's built all around the light coming in and like how it interacts with everything around it and it, that bit's really lovely to me like there's something that <laughs> speaks really deeply to me about the light streaming in through a window that's also full of house plants and then that falling on like the tapestry on the wall and playing with it yeah it's, it, it's that's just lovely mm. um, but overall I'm going to go out here and say that I don't enjoy historic houses all that much because I've only really been to extremely posh ones and even then only less than five maybe mm. in total and yeah. I think this is my contrary nature and my working class background. <laughs> I am bored by the extreme wealth of people who are dead. I don't relate to that at all. Yes. I find it intimidating. I just feel tremendously not at home and not particularly welcome, even mm. though that's totally not the vibe they want to give off. But it's just, it's not something I can relate to. So again, I'm totally with you on like seeing the servants' quarters and the corridors where people actually walk to their cups of tea. That's so much more relatable. But you have to really dig around to get to those bits and you have to get mm. past all this ostentatious stuff of like... Uh, come in, peasant. Don't touch anything. You will filthy it with your breath. I just can't be doing with it. And I understand that's controversial, um, but I, I do find it quite challenging, um, which is why I quite like when people try to subvert that or address that. I like that the National Trust is doing a lot of stuff about being a bit more decolonial and addressing some of these power imbalances in their properties and trying to interpret things in new and exciting ways to bring in people who wouldn't normally feel welcome because I, I don't find them welcoming. <laughs> I find them posh, they're annoying to get to, they're expensive <laughs> to get into. In in general, for me, those are all barriers, right? I And it's just like, why? Why why go here and feel alienated? Um, you talking about this and, and, you know, the amount of wealth that we see in these houses, it reminds me of I don't know if I can call it a house museum. Maybe we can come up, uh, we can use our definition from earlier to determine whether or yeah. not this is a house. So it is a small section of a street of houses, Ooh. kind of, that was taken from China and brought to the Peabody Museum. It's the Peabody Essex. It's a museum outside of Boston. And they took this section of street, put it down outside the museum. It's not in a shell or anything, but every single item inside of it has been completely maintained. And it's all from a working class family, a group of families that were all living in these houses together. And it was very much like an open floor plan, um, shared living space. Mm -hmm. Learn the stories of all the different people that lived there. But I'm bringing it back to what Jenny was saying, because... You talked about feeling a sense of alienation. And one of the things that this museum has done, in addition to taking such great care of maintaining the property, is they host cultural events mm. for local communities, going back to some of them to the same town, I believe. Um, but they've done a lot of community outreach. Oh, that's cool. On the basis of using this property. Oh, I like that. 
I guess we do do that here a little bit in that we do have open air museums. Mm. Like buildings can be completely rebuilt brick by brick and then very much the interior being recreated and exactly maintained. Some wagons, for example, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, beamish, that sort of thing. Mm. Uh, that does happen and it is really cool and deserves its own episode because they are amazing places. Um, absolutely. So I think it, it's definitely adjacent too, isn't it? In reference to your, the come in and don't touch anything because to, you're too common <laughs> <laughs> feeling. How does that feel when the conservation aim is to do basically that in these historic mm. houses now? Like it, it used to be come in but don't touch anything because you're too you know grubby and poor and now it's come in and don't touch anything because we're trying to preserve to yeah 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 we're preserving yeah, yeah. the longevity of etc etc it feels better with my professional background uh-huh. you see what i mean because yeah, yeah, i yeah. can i can see the reasons why mm. but it still has an air of whilst we're making those decisions for those reasons you know you you can't the facade is the facade you know it's still an ostentatious house you're still wandering through an immense display of you know wealth and often colonialism you know like it's not super uncommon to see (laughs) some awfully racist things in (laughs) well this is inappropriate Um, i understand that it's of the time it's still challenging from that point of view uh but you know the other side might be lessened by the fact that i now have a professional background that i can understand that but i would imagine that probably doesn't matter to someone who doesn't have the professional background that it might still feel a little bit like you're not really allowed here and you know, don't tread on the carpet mm. i ask how that is different for you like how that experience is different in a house museum versus a traditional museum oh no like um oh, it's both yeah <laughs> i find i find both problematic um yeah which is probably why i'm quite pro touch and pro use and like in general uh let's let's break down some barriers but you do have different um maybe visual clues in a historic um house setting versus a museum i have another house museum to bring up it's the horn museum in florence and this museum isn't pro use in a like a physical touch sense but it does eliminate all of the visual cues that we're used to having in a museum or in a house museum okay so there aren't any placards there's no information you are just expected to walk through the house and feel it as an experience as the people that would have walked through these rooms every day Mm. and that's part of the concept oh that is interesting yeah yeah okay that is interesting and a very different take we have a lot of school groups that go through. So a lot of like Italian children that live near Florence go to this museum, which is so interesting when they have all of the museums in Florence yeah. to go to. This is one of the most popular ones. I can kind of understand that from an education perspective. It forces you to engage with the art in a very different way. You can't just be a passive observer. You have to connect I can totally see that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Oh, that's a fun way of doing it. Mm, I, I like, like that. that. I like that. Yeah. I think that's I think the the favorite houses that I've ever been to are the ones that you where you can go into the rooms and you can see the things as they were sort of thing rather than like Oh yeah, we set this up. This used to be the dining room, but now it's a bedroom because people like bedrooms. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, that's always a bit weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Something that's come to me whilst you were talking about this is the ways that we as conservators mitigate damage in historic con- house contexts. Has anyone seen any really cool ones? I always like the little thistle or pine cone oh, on yeah. a chair. To say, don't sit on this, it'll be uncomfortable. Uh, as opposed to the sign that says, do not sit on the chair. I always like that. I think it's cute. Yeah, yeah I like that. Um, I'm not a fan of the velvet rope or the acrylic barrier. I'm not really a fan of those things. Okay. But I don't necessarily know what a good option is if you don't want people pure kicking things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the other hand, maybe don't keep extremely okay. kickable things there. Mm, you could keep those further into the room if you wanted to, but... I like a carpet. I like a a visual, like bright color carpet. The adventure line. This is where you walk. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm super interested in that because my example was going to be printed carpet overlays that you can have that disguise Ooh, themselves yeah. with the original carpet. 
Those are kind of gorgeous, actually. Yeah. Well, I've never seen that. Oh, it's so cool. I've seen it in a couple. The, the one that dr- springs to mind is Langworthy House in, in Leeds. That was the first time I saw it. And then since then, I've seen it in other places. No, I mentioned a bright color, not because I particularly like it aesthetically, but if it's a bright enough color that it would be extremely visible to the viewer, you wouldn't need to have ropes or any yeah, blockages. Yeah. And it's, it's a sense of signal that this is where you walk as opposed to, yeah, I think that I think, yeah. I think there's something to be said for that, you know, like I like that a lot. <laughs> I'm really interested in the, the part ownership thing or the part mm. open thing because I'm so used to going to National Trust or Historic England properties where they are under the ownership and management of those organisations. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But I did once, uh, this is such a weird anecdote. Uh, I've been to a a couple of historic houses where the, you know, the tour guides go, oh, and so we're open at this time and this time. And in this part of the house, you can't go into that because so-and-so lives here. Sometimes they stroll around. Don't worry. That sort of thing. (laughs) Uh, But one of them was Holker Hall in the uh, northwest. And I was there because I was dancing at a chili fest (laughs) <laughs> chili as in chilies that you eat nice okay uh doing belly dancing at a chili fest amazing and so it was just uh it was the ho- the grounds were the host of this festival and it was oh, all very weird but um <laughs> it was the kind of place that was sort of also open you know i suppose kept running by these sorts of events yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. weddings and you know yeah. that sort of thing but yeah, I just found that really interesting because uh, in the run up to this episode, I was thinking, what is it that w- if they're not owned by, you know, the National Trust, blah, 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 and then they're not open, what are these things? Like, do we, wh- why don't we know of any? But we do. We know of thousands. Well, at least two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know thousands because they are your spa holidays. And that's a good point. Your wedding, yeah, your that's big true. fancy wedding venue. And, but they're you more know, like venues rather than... Mm, museums because at that point they're yeah yeah. Mm. and I don't know that the people maintaining them are casting such a strong eye towards conservation or preservation they probably are more interested in modernizing those spaces or or keeping the ones that will add value if you see what I mean (laughs) yes but I don't think they're fully modernized because there's there's a couple that jump to mind that there are different function rooms and they'd maintain the sort of historic original features i suppose and just you know change up the 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 event spaces for what they need to be i recognize that this does change if you it's a spa and they've filled part of it with water (laughs) whatever (laughs) Um, but i think it's 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 just interesting as part of the how how these houses have been used and maintained over the years and repurposed and actually, one that really jumps to mind that I think we need to give an honourable mention to is West Dean. Oh, yes. Tell people what West Dean is. Oh, my God. Sorry for the UK focus, everyone. Um, so West Dean is it's a large historic house that was owned by a, an enthusiast of the arts, basically. And throughout his life, uh, in fact, there is I talk about this in one of the episodes. You do. And I do a little tour because I um, because it's the Hogwarts of it's the conservation. Hogwarts because of it's conservation. also their home to one of the conservation schools yeah. in the UK. Yeah. Uh, and that is because, and loads of our listeners will be either past or current students at West Dean because they, they, uh, they do all sorts of things. It's the kind of place you can go to learn bookbinding and plastics conservation. Residential courses, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's- um, no. And all of that is because <laughs> the original owner or one of the original owners said in the will... Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Dictated (laughs) legally that it had to be used for artistic pursuits only. Ah, How nice is that? So it's got all of the same fancy pants, everything, and oh my god, it's so gorgeous inside, and you can stay there. The the (laughs) the, some of the rooms have obviously been adapted so that you can stay in there, and there's I think student residential accommodation built on site, but for the most part, it is all as it was and particularly like you know the 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 artist stairs because a you know collection of artists used to live there and create there and stuff i've still never been uh, oh I'm my god it's, going at some point because it's really it really amazing. good it's really good yeah honorable mention to the repurposing there's a similar case to this in the united states and i'm very sorry to tell you this story because it doesn't end well no 
no. Oh, no. I know. Okay, I'll, I'll brace myself. <laughs> you, Jenny, you should. <laughs> so the Barnes Foundation was originally back in the 1900s. It was a house on the outskirts of Philadelphia on this property. And um, the man who owned it had an amazing collection of uh, impressionist paintings, amazing pieces. He used the building uh, as part like museum-ish space. I, I don't know the details. I think the public could come and see it. But mostly the building was for art students. And the purpose of having all of this art was for the artists to be able to look at and engage with it and be inspired and in his will, he said that he wanted the institution to stay in that form. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, <laughs> in 2012, the Barnes Foundation was moved by a lot of very wealthy Philadelphia <sighs> barons uh, to the center of the city because they didn't want to go all the way out in order to see the art. Oh, come on! Some of the neighbors of the museum also complained because it was in a residential area. And I think that there probably were workarounds for that. But they used that as the basis of their argument legally to be able to negate the will and move everything. There's a documentary about them as well that's very, very good. But it does end poorly. Oh, that sucks. Are these people haunted now by the person? (laughs) They should be. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Random shout out to our various Halloween episodes where we talk about ghosts in historic houses. <laughs> True. That's a crap segue, but mm. it jumped into my head. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's fair enough, really. So as well as ghosts, obviously, <laughs> there are loads of other <laughs> conservation challenges in historic houses. Other than just people touching the stuff and walking on the carpets as well. Yes, that's true. That's yeah, true. It is a more like friendly environment, so I think people are more likely to reach out and feel at home touching some things but is that okay like is that fine like those people have the occasional touch of something i don't know i don't i don't mind it i don't mind it <laughs> chloe looks tired immediately i love the face of chloe right now <laughs> no it's it's more like i'm i don't mind because it's inevitable if you see what i mean yes. like i am not as good a person as jenny is with the whole touch situation i i'd really r- much rather people didn't apart from on specific events though i know i've i've flip flopped around on this topic through the history of the podcast um <laughs> and I, I i don't really know where always to stick. allowed to evolve as a person and change your mind in any way you I want i don't know i know in my museum all of my open display textiles they're fondled all the time and I don't like it, but it's inevitable. There's also something irresistible about textiles, to be oh, honest, because it's true. the primary way that we actually interact with textiles is touching them in some way. True. And then, yeah. you know, the notion of there being like, you know, like one of those gorgeous big beds with like all of the drapes and stuff, the notion to not lean in and just go. <laughs> <laughs> so Jenny just stuck a single finger out and did a stroking gesture. <laughs> what I thought you were going to say is that the temptation to do proper flumpy belly flop onto oh God, one no. of the historic beds. I have that impulse. Do you not? No, I is do that not, not normal? jump into one of these. No, I'm pretty sure it is perfectly normal, but it's just that I'm an extremely short person and they are tall beds. I would need like a run up and like some sort of springboard and that. Like, I'm not here for but that. But you would fit into them. Oh, yeah, they are because they're short. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Good point. <laughs> don't do that, everyone. That is definitely yeah, over yeah. the line, both definitely don't. physically and don't do that. metaphorically. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Okay. Jenny, what you say about textiles being like a very tactile material Mm. that we're used to interacting with, it makes me think that paintings are very much the opposite of that. Mm. I think that everyone sees a painting on a wall and you have to really want to touch it in order to make contact with it. Yeah, I agree. Like this platonic ideal in our head that a painting is to be observed and not touched. Yeah, it goes on the wall. Like it, it... It's not there for like strokey strokey. That's not what that is, you know? 
Yeah, so I think you probably have different problems with different kinds of materials mm. and items. Yeah, sure. and, and I could totally see the chair thing with the with the thistle on it because the temptation is to sit on the chair, you know, like it's there for sitting on. Um, so why not sit on it sort of thing? So I, I, yeah, so I would imagine you get it more with certain things than you would with others. Uh, I would mm. love for someone from the National Trust to tell us what is your most touched thing. Yes. <laughs> I would love to hear that. <laughs> or any historic house at all. I want to hear what your most touched thing is. Uh, Why do I feel like it's something stone? Ooh, yeah, oh, maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe if it's yeah. like an animal in stone, it definitely pet- petable, right? Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. the stone cat, gonna touch it. Or like the breasts of a bronze statue. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my most horrifying story that anyone's told me is that a historic house which did have weddings in it, mm. um, that people did get a little bit gazeboed and uh, put on very red lipstick and started kissing the marble statues oh, no! oh, which is not good because that stuff is very difficult to get off wow oh, yes don't do that <laughs> but yeah so that's my favorite horror story um which might fall slightly more under, th- under like theft and vandalism in terms of like <laughs> definitely yeah definitely you're not allowed to cop a feel and you're also not allowed to <laughs> to leave smoochy marks no okay there are actually some great uh, like contemporary art papers that dig into how to remove lipstick because it is quite a problem. No. Yes, it is. That's yeah. amazing. Mm-hmm. I was also thinking of stuff like um, in some historic houses, for example, you may want to show an open fire. For example, I've definitely been to historic houses where uh, the whole point is that they can run the range in the kitchen. So it's got real Ooh. coal in it. And like, oh obviously that would maybe deposit somewhere there will be a bit of smoke and stuff like that yeah. so whether you know that that sort of thing um you know obviously that affects the the items on display or around it certainly anyway um but but that may be a really big deal in terms of authenticity and the use of like showing people what um a victorian kitchen would have smelled like and felt like and stuff like that which is an interesting part of this sort of experience that may or may not be part of historic house practices but depending on what sort of um space you're in and what your i suppose what your aims are with having the historic house museum do you want it to be you know shown off as it would have been used but not necessarily with rare actors um or yeah like you know there's a whole range here but bringing up reenactors is interesting because there are so many examples of reenactments happening mm. in historic houses, especially in the US. We have so many like... You're so big on that there. I love it. <laughs> I'm really here for it. I even had something like that for Wisconsin. We had Old, Ta- old Town Wisconsin, Old World Wisconsin, oh. but you would go and it was all reenactors of like, you know, the white settlers. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Still, though, I'm very much here for reenactors. I think it's quite fun. Uh, but it's not necessarily mm-hmm. something you see in all historic houses or anything. Yeah. In fact, I, I think we're more used to, at least here in the UK, we're more used to seeing sort of a, a person in a uniform of the organisation that, you know, runs the property uh, standing there going, please don't touch anything. Here's a map. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> in a house that's been continuin- continually inhabited for mm. 200 years, what era are we conserving? When we're conserving an era. That's a great question. What era are we interpreting, you know, with the reenactors? What kind of heating are we using when we want to create an impression of, you know, if the heating came in like 150 years after the house was built, then that will feel very different and smell very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's true. And I, that's the sort of question that I really enjoy. Mm, mm. And I like trying to unpick if I do visit a place. Because uh, I certainly re- remember in my in my undergrad, we did go to a historic house in Dorset somewhere. And uh, we were sort of encouraged to ask those sorts of questions of ourselves. Yeah. Sort of like going into a room and going, which era is this from? And what what is the specific reason that they might have chosen to show you a Georgian bedroom or whatever, <laughs> you know, like what's the, you know, like what's, what's the deal here? I've seen some house museums that try to merge multiple different eras mm. together Ooh. into one house and that can work, but sometimes it does feel like you're just trying to offer more to the public mm, and you're yeah. just sort of filling up space. How relevant is this to the most important history of the building? 
doesn't feel very but now you have another bedroom that people can walk mm, through and take mm, photos yeah, yeah yeah and it can feel really disjointed if it's done like mm. a little bit too blatantly because <laughs> sometimes yeah. frankly one wood paneled room looks much like the other <laughs> and the fact that it's a slightly different style of the chairs doesn't bother me um but you know when it's something like and here's the 50s kitchen no, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, like, exactly. that is idiosyncratic <laughs> yeah i'm having whiplash i can't <laughs> Yeah, I was just thinking that it would be super amusing to go into, you know, the houses that are still uh, lived in now, if they were to be sold and you'd be trying to represent all of the, like, eras of them, then what do you do about the Georgian the Georgian bedroom that was an office and is now a, you know, teenager's bedroom and there's a Justin Bieber poster on the wall? Like, but, yeah, which but just <laughs> brings up some interesting questions, though. Are historic houses still made? Would anyone try to represent today Ooh. in a historic house? What would that look like? What would that? What would the challenges of that be? Good luck with your plastics. Um, <laughs> exactly. You know, like what? What would that be like? And is that even likely to be a thing that comes up? I mean, we'd like to think that in the future someone would be interested in mm. our immediate past, but is it? Is that done? Is that is anywhere planning for the future in such a way, or is it not possible to know that until a hundred years later when someone went? That really famous guy lived there once. Let's buy that house and pretend we knew what it looked like. Yeah. <laughs> With the IKEA furniture. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, or is that how it works? I, I'm genuinely curious if there's any sort of contemporary mm. creation almost, or with an eye to this will one day probably be endowed to a trust or, mm. you know, like something like that. I'm very mm. curious if that sort of thing happens or if we're sort of over ourselves like nothing we do now is that important that it's worth writing down in a will that this is going to go to the national trust because oh well pest is another big thing because i'm i'm filled with horror just at the idea of the sort of underneath the floorboards in my edwardian bog standard terrace in england let alone what might be going on in the historic houses i mean i would imagine the pest monitoring works much the same like it would in museums mm. You would probably have some different options in terms of how to possibly control your environment and stuff like that because you you can't. It's an open house. You can't. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I also don't think that everybody who's doing the maintenance in a house museum is going to be a conservator. You just don't have that luxury. No, and a lot a lot of them have volunteers who are then trained, uh, for example. Yeah. But uh, you know, they're still volunteers. Um, it's it is what it is, isn't it? So it it just works differently. That can be a nice opportunity to also engage the public. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I've seen some uh, places do some interesting stuff with like highlighting that we are having troubles with pests. If you see any of these, you should tell us. Mm. Uh, this is what they look like. And then they have like giant knitted uh, clothes moths or something. Aww. And like, tell us if you see any of these flying about. <laughs> They're quite small and stuff like that, which uh, I, I guess that's just public engagement and making the most out of having loads of eyes in the house. Mm. I'm interested, Jenny, in your perspective of damp in <sighs> in historic houses. And I say you particularly because I know you studied standing structure conservation before. Yes, that's true. And I'm really like <laughs> distracted by the enormity of the problem that I see. I don't think I've been to an, his an historic house where I have not seen a damp patch on a wall. Oh yeah, mm. that that counts as the territory. Exactly, the issues of of just general extremely high RH in those houses. It is worth noting that you know often the things in there have acclimatized to being mm -hmm. in slightly wetter conditions. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, coming in there and shutting all the doors and then putting in massive dehumidifiers would make everything very sad. Yes, <laughs> um, a bigger problem is mold. Yeah. Um, so if you don't have enough airflow, for example, during lockdown when loads of these places were shut very suddenly and and, and left with no airflow whatsoever and no people moving through them because even the even having people walking through a room at a slow pace is enough to create airflow mm. uh, that discourages mold from growing you know that's a much bigger problem to me is that the mold grows and stuff like that but if it's a house in use, arguably, you don't have the problem as much. Mm. Um, but obviously, RH plays a huge part in that because it, it, it needs to be nice and damp for mold to grow. Yeah. So, yeah, it is one of those things. The UK is very damp. Uh, yeah. for, for listeners <laughs> abroad, UK is incredibly damp. So, yeah, we do have that a lot. Um, that, that's fun to contend with. 
But the opposite is true in Italy, which is quite dry. That so makes you'll sense. not only be walking through house museums, you'll be walking through any museum and windows will be open very casually, free flowing air in the breeze. Wow. God, that's totally. really blowing. In some ways, Sweden is the same because the RH is quite low usually. Um, oh, good Jesus. It's because it, like? it's cold and dry. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you have the opposite thing there of like you actually mm. need to add moisture because the wood's cracking so it's, it's different across the world um and a surprise to no one probably but yeah uk very damn <laughs> <laughs> oh hey uh, jenny here just butting in in the middle of this episode sorry about that um just to say a warm welcome to our latest patron trisha thank you so much for joining us uh, and if you want to support us and the work that we do here on the podcast then you can head over to patreon.com slash the c word there's loads of extra content on there and we're adding more all the time so it is well worth checking out so do please join our little community on there it would be great to have you all right okay back to the episode For today's interview, I sat down with Jane Wilkinson, the head of conservation at the Sir John Soane Museum in London. Sir John Soane was an architect in the early 1800s, and he turned his collection of artifacts and sculptural elements into a house museum. The museum is still maintained to this day, and it is on my personal list of recommendations. Jane, it's lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you, Liz. I would just like to start by saying um, one of my favorite books that I've ever bought in a museum store was purchased at the Sir John Soane. Yeah, it's the complete history of the museum. Yeah, it's great. (laughs) And at the back, there is a timeline that. Yeah, it's really interesting the timeline going right back to Soane. Yeah. Yeah, so it has all of the different restoration projects that the museum has done. Yeah. You know, Jenny, Chloe, and I were actually talking about house museums and how one of the things that they have to account for is what era of the museum's history or the the house's history is the museum trying to reference or portray to the viewer. What does that look like at the zone? Well, I think the thing is that um, there was this Act of Parliament, I'm sure you know, that was passed, which... um, which Soane was very instrumental in, and it, it said that the house should be kept as close as possible to how it was on at the time of his death. And so he died in 1837, and the curators that followed all, I think, did try and honour that. Um, some were more successful than others. We had one very, um, well, his name was... James Wilde, and he was wild by name and wild by nature. He was the the bad curator who thought he could do better than so, and so he tinkered and changed quite a lot of things quite radically. Yeah. And um, so there were instances like that, and also there were times when really just through expediency things got changed. So, for instance, um, Objects might get moved at, at times, like when they put electricity in and they needed to put a light switch somewhere, they might move an object out of position. So, um, yeah, it, it changed over the, the 200 years nearly since he died. But but in essence, everybody was trying to honour the Act of Parliament. But when I came in the 1980s, um, it was in quite a bad way in the sense that there'd be very little money um, available for the museum through the 20th century. Mm. Peter Thornton was appointed as the director in 1984 and he came from, he was the first curator who wasn't an architect so it was always specified that the curator should be an architect which it, which was I think a bit of a mistake by Soane because of course it meant they all thought they knew better or some of them did, you know, I mean there was a real danger that because they were architects themselves they go, yeah, you have a bit of ego at play there. Yeah, and so Peter was the first curator who was not an architect, and he was he came from the V&A, and he was head of furniture there, and his sort of special subject was historic interiors, and he did it. He wrote two rather amazing books on historic interiors throughout Europe, actually. So he came here, and he thought the rooms are not quite right and we have this amazing uh, resource in terms of we have fantastic 
archive material, both visual and written. And he set about trying to reinstate the rooms much more accurately how they would have been when Soane was alive or at the time of his death. And um, and really, I came when he'd only been here less than a year, and then the deputy director, Helen Dory, came a couple of years after me. So we were kind of trained by him, really, yes. and we've all retained the same attitude that he instilled into us, which was, firstly, we have to follow the Act of Parliament, so we have to find out what this, this space or this arrangement was like in 1837. And also, I think we very much feel like... Everything we do, we think if Mrs. Sone or John Sone walked into the room suddenly, would they be happy with it? Would they think, yes, this is, I'm familiar with this. This is how this room should look. Mm. And it really does feel that way when you're there in person. Uh, I just want to make sure the listener appreciates how much interior work has happened at the museum, specifically in the living quarters. When I visited, they talked about how the space was used for offices during World War II. So it's been a really big effort to get it to the current appearance. So, yeah, when I came here in the 80s, uh, the second floor was just three spaces. It was the director's office and then there was a large room that was the director's office, but it was also where we had our tea and coffee. So, yeah, they've gone through these permutations. And this, you know, in some ways, I think sometimes not having very much money can be quite a blessing Mm. because it means people don't, they don't change things, um, you know, too readily and they often reuse things. So, um, There's a very strange and not typical shaped door, very tall and thin, that goes on the a tiny space next to Sone's bedroom called the oratory, and um, we through Helen's research she found that it had been repurposed as a cupboard door on the ground floor, so we were able to bring it back and Ah. put it back. So you know, yeah, it's very it's lovely working here because you often discover that something you've you think is lost or is mislaid is you can find it um it's it's always very uh, thrilling when that happens actually yeah i can imagine you know you've been working at the zone for many years now but what are your current responsibilities as the head of conservation right well when i came here um peter appointed me in a part-time paper conservator and we were the first conservators ever to work at the museum Mm -hmm. they never had them before and we were part-time for many years and then the work increased so they said would I come full-time and then they asked me to be head of conservation but for many years there was just me and the paper conservator and there were no regimes set up like there was no light monitoring there was no environmental monitoring no pest control so over the years I gradually set those things up and then as when we did the big outs project when we put back the private apartments there was such a lot of work and uh in lots of different ways that we managed to get the funding for a part-time assistant conservator so during the outs project i had an assistant conservator working with me and at the end of that i argued that we now had sort of eight new spaces that we had to look after and in in tandem with that the amount of events that were being run to raise money had increased massively so we had many more responsibilities so I did argue that we needed more um, conservators so we now are a very small department still because none of us are five days a week um, but that I'm I work four days and I have two uh, conservators I got them promoted from assistant I said they've got too many skilled things to do to, you've got to call them conservators so um, they work with me and they're both part-time and then we have a paper conservator who's a consultant but she's worked with me for 12 years now and she she is quite embedded in quite a lot of the things we do so like the light when we're when we're trying to work out light plans and things she's very involved so to answer your question I think our responsibilities cover um day-to-day care so a lot of dusting (laughs) a lot of um, regimes like IPM and um, environmental monitoring a lot of support to other colleagues in other departments. Well it sounds like you've done a very good job advocating for staffing in your department. Well that was a few years ago I'm I'm not mind some more. (laughs) We do do um, bench work Um, until last year I don't think 
we'd ever not been working on a major restoration project. So we were doing lots of bench work, particularly plaster casts and frames. Uh, we tend to, the people, the things we send out to consultants or have consultants come in and work on are paintings and large sculpture and in the past furniture. But one of the one of my colleagues is uh, has done furniture conservation for quite a number of years, so we can do a certain amount in house now. Um, so yeah, um, we love doing the bench work, but um, we we're quite relieved not to be doing a major project. Well, I am because I literally have been doing them for about twenty years or twenty five years, and the problem with them is that they're very exciting and they're hard work and they're very pressured but really interesting, but it makes it very hard to keep on top of um, all the other kind of more ordinary care of collections work. Yeah, I imagine that those day-to-day activities are quite important, but easy to overlook. Yeah, they are really important, actually. And I think also what we've noticed has become really important uh, is, again, this whole element of supporting events and making sure they're done in the right way. So we've written an enormous manual (laughs) of of, um, use of the museum spaces, which everybody is meant to be familiar with and they're meant to follow. Along those lines, was that a nice moment for you as a colleague to better understand the other departments and also promote what conservation does for the museum yeah and I think it's it's terribly important I mean to actually wherever possible tell people what you do so for instance I was asked to give a really short I think it was something like 15 minute presentation to the trustees about what conservation does and I just gave them everything that we do and they were all completely gobsmacked they went oh my god we didn't realize what you did and in fact I'm planning to do the same talk for all my colleagues because it is very easy for people to us and other colleagues to be busy doing what we're doing and the only interaction is when you go, no, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you don't want that to be the only interaction. You want people to get it, really. So we try to have a really open door policy and encourage people. That's so lovely to hear and very important. I really appreciate that work. Hello, everyone. This is Fedra talking to you from sunny Cyprus. Today I'm taking you on an excursion to a historic house in the mountain village of Lefkara. Cyprus, as well as Greece and many other Balkan countries, has many historic houses often found in small villages in the middle of the countryside and up the mountains. Unlike many UK historic houses, these houses do not reflect the life of one single wealthy family, but rather reflects the everyday life of villagers. The exhibited objects usually are silverware, icons, photographs, and furniture from the great-grandparents and other family members of current villagers. These historic houses are usually called Musia Laikis Technis, which translates as folk art museums. The village of Lefkara is located at the foot of the Troodos mountain in the southeastern region of Cyprus. And the name Lefkara is derived from a combination of uh, two Greek words, Lefka, which means white, because of the white color of the silica and limestone used in the construction of the houses in the village, and Ori, which means mountain or hill. It is world renowned for its traditional handicrafts of lace embroidery and filigree silver. These crafts have been passed down from generation to generation from as far back as the Venetian times. Legend has it that Leonardo da Vinci visited the village in 1481 and bought a lace altar cloth, which he donated to the Milan Cathedral. The legend also claims that this Lefkara embroidery inspired the tablecloth he painted within his famous representation of the Last Supper. So, the historic house I am visiting today is called the House of Pazalos, after its last owner before it was purchased and repurposed by the Department of Antiquities of Cyprus. It was converted into the local museum of traditional embroidery and silversmithing in 1988. The building dates back to the 19th century and comprises some additions made in the 20th century. If you would like to follow along with me, there is a beautiful virtual tour that is available and you can find it in the show notes. So click on that link so that we can visit this place together. I have now arrived at the village of Lefkara, 
we were greeted by a nice little sign that said welcome to Lefkara with pictures of women embroidering. There is also a nice mosaic on the side of the road with depictions of women and some patterns that kind of mimic embroidery. So there is limestone everywhere, even the paved road is made out of this white limestone. It seems that blue is the color of the village. Every building I see has some plastered blue wall. I also see blue painted shutters all over the place. All right, so I have just arrived in front of the property. It says 1898 on top of the wooden door. So let's explore. I have entered the museum and I am now in a indoor outdoor room. This is probably where they kept their animals. Above me, I see a lot of beans and some intertwined branches of wood as well. It's really quite wonderful. I have arrived to the central courtyard. There are some beautiful plants around me. So you have some cacti, lilies, and a very full orange tree. All right, so the first room to enter is a video room where we are introduced to the story of the village and of lace making. It's actually quite sweet. The video begins with a little introduction of the village and then you have some interviews of older women who talk about their childhood and how they used to sit next to their grandmothers to learn the craft. It then continues with interviews of older men who talk about how after 1903 they used to travel to Egypt and then to Europe to sell some of those lace embroideries. All right, I'm still in the courtyard. I can see a really rusty scale. I believe that there's a little explanation as well in the guided tour. There are also some really big pithy. Uh, the one I'm looking at right now says 1881 on it. And to be honest, I think I can fit in there. Hey, Aaron, do you think we can both fit in there? Probably. <laughs> Guys, we've done this before. All right, and I am about to enter the dining room. Ooh, cane baskets. Oh no, actually the cane is covering some glass bottle. Interesting. I am now in the cellar. I am surrounded by giant pithy, and some of them have maker's marks and dates on them. Ceramic storage containers have been used around Cyprus since the Chalcolithic times. They used to store agricultural products and they're still used to this day. These used to include olive oil, wine or flour. It smells kind of moldy. That's what a cellar should smell like. I see a yoke hanging on the wall, so that would have been something they put around the neck of oxen or donkeys for transportation. Alrighty, let's head back to the courtyard, shall we? I am now going up a steep limestone staircase with a very nice wooden ramp. I assume you just heard the wooden door being open. I was kindly asked to close the door on my way in because they have some problems with pigeons entering the building. I am now in the first room. It is plastered with Venetian blue all around. All right, so from the entrance hall, I can see three different rooms to enter from. I am now entering the left-hand room. So, I am greeted by a very nice sign that explains local embroidering techniques. I am surrounded by really huge white tablecloths with embroidered geometric shapes. One of the embroideries stands out. It has a bit of a grayish color. It has a crown embroidered on it. It says that this 
tablecloth is a souvenir of the coronation of Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II, presented by the Valais Merchants Association of Lefkara, Cyprus, 1952. I have now entered a private bedroom. Here I see a tall wooden bed with intricate wood carvings and some Lefkara embroidered bedding on top of it. Heading down a small staircase. The first thing I see here is silver sensors. These were used to put incense inside. They're still used today in Orthodox churches. These sensors also have some intricate decoration that kind of mimic lace. This village was also well known for its silversmithing, so this is one example of it. Oh, cool! There are some tools for silversmithing as well. Apparently, the silversmiths of the village used to make small-sized intricate jewelry in the Trifuri technique, which is filigree technique in English, imitates lace work with gold or silver wires. I am now back in the central hallway and I will be entering the room to my right. This room seems to be a reproduction of a traditional Lefkara house common room. I see a wooden shelf filled with some shot glasses and other containers. I see curtains, which are all made with Lefka traditional embroidery. I see a central dining table and wooden chairs. What's interesting here is that every piece of furniture and every shelf has an actual cloth on it and on top of each cloth is a piece of glass. I guess that's a very Cypriot and Greek thing. I remember when I was a kid my grandma even had a lacy tablecloth on top of her TV and whenever she wasn't watching TV she would put it there in order to prevent dust from building up on top of it. I have just found a beautiful embroidered artwork titled Ios Keto Aramatu Iliu, dating from 1907. The title would translate to Ios and the Chariot of the Sun. There seems to be a winged woman on a chariot and there is an angel holding a basket of flowers and the sun is represented with a female figure I have now entered the last room. It is a bedroom. I see another tall bed with embroidered bedding. Next to it is a mannequin of a woman wearing a white embroidered nightgown. And right next to her is a beautiful bassinet made of metal and covered in embroidered cloth. This audio tour has now come to an end. I hope you've enjoyed it. Once again, as I said, you can follow the virtual tour online. There are a lot of things that I haven't mentioned here, so it's really worth it to go and have a look yourself. Bye! So I'm here with National Trust curator, Helen Anchevus. Hello. Thanks for having me back. Uh, if you listened to the Working with Curators episode, um, Helen was the glamorous guest host of that episode. Um, and she's also one of my besties. And we live in the same town. And uh, I've yeah, <laughs> drawn her in. <laughs> Always happy, always happy to be on. <laughs> so um, we recorded the episode last week and I had a couple of questions associated with the National Trust as a, an entity in a workplace. Mm -hmm. To start with, what are the collections actually like in the National Trust? So are they held um, in their associated properties um, or are they stored 
in a big storage location? Do they ever leave the properties? How does that work? Yeah, it's a great question. So one of my favourite things about working at the National Trust is it is an internationally renowned national collection in a historic house setting. So it, it's things that you would you could easily go to the British Museum, to the v to National Gallery, and you can see counterparts there but they're in these sort of really beautifully contextualized settings of how they would have been engaged with and seen in their kind of original context so they are kept in their properties even though it's an it is a national collection many of these collections came in with the houses um when they were given so everything is kept on site and regionally there are some larger storage facilities as well for certain properties or certain collections um but that is quite rare i would say in my experience of working with many different um house collections but primarily they are kept with the house they came with because that's our cell that's the thing that makes the national trust so special is that they can show them and look after them in their many of them in their original contexts so how does working with conservation work as a curator of the national trust I mean, you know how much I love, and for me, you know, conservator is law. And <laughs> yes! I think I've said that a few times <laughs> in my appearances of, and I will always say as a curator, is that it's one of the most important relationships that you have. I think you're a team, you have to work as a team, you have to listen to each other. And every experience I've had with working with curators in the trust and everywhere because I work with you Um, but everywhere is really how much they have encouraged and influenced my own research into certain objects there are things that that conservators can find and understand that I can't find and understand Um, and I find it a really brilliant experience the conservators at the trust have to be both I would say generalist and expert they have to know about a range of a host of objects They have to be so agile, I think, in what they're working with. And I've I've worked with creators in several of our regions and I can say they're all absolutely fabulous um, and have a real understanding of of the, I think, not just kind of the museological context of these objects, but that significance of the historic house. And a lot of them have to conserve the house itself. So it's not just object conservation it's understanding the four walls and seeing that entity as an object in itself which I find really fascinating so to know that they're conserving furniture textiles art is is one thing but then to hear conservators talking about the wallpaper and the woodwork and the fireplaces that to me is just fascinating so yeah they're a great bunch they're a great bunch finally what's your favorite conservation story of your experience i mean i have i've worked with loads of brilliant curators at the trust um but one of my favorite things i'm currently working on is currently working on a lot of the fashion and dress collection at the trust and working with the textile conservation studio at blickling so the national trust has an absolutely remarkable textile conservation studio if you watch the bbc series treasures of the national trust all right they are like the stars (laughs) they are the celebrities of that series because they do so much and um visiting that studio is like it's like visiting i don't know a, a cave of wonders you know you go in and you see the El- last time I was there, Ellen Terry's dresses were there being being conserved. Oh, wow. um, so many beautiful things from all over the Trust coming in and being looked after there. And one of my favourite things um, that they've conserved recently is a wedding dress that I'm doing some research on. Oh. Um, and they were just remounting it and just seeing it remounted. And, you know, you see the power of showcasing things out of the box and and just with a little bit of retouching and properly cared for work it it changes the meaning it changes how you you see it it changes how we as curators experience it before even visitors do because it allows us to re-engage and to understand and that's what I love about that relationship is that it I, I feel like I'm always learning from conservatives not just how to care for objects but they, I feel like they reveal so many of the secrets of the objects that you don't get if you're just looking at it 
on collections online. I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's a really exciting project to be working on with them. Thanks for listening. We're the C Word, and you've been listening to Liz, Chloe, and Jenny today. Join us next time for an episode about working with heritage scientists. In the meantime, you can check out our website at theseaword.show or check us out on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and the Fediverse. The intro and outro music is Spring by Didi Music, used under Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. And as always, this has been a Wooden Dice production. <laughs>